Apparently, the ship gave her the name Phyllis. And Wheatley was her owner's name. Today, I'm not here so much to honor the name Phyllis Wheatley, the achievements that she has as a writer stand alone. I stand here today to honor her ancestors. I'm not here to applaud her writings. I'm here to applaud her life's journey, her experience. Phyllis Wheatley was not her true name. And it's telling that 246 years later, we still can find no record of her. Her name, where she was born. And this speaks volumes of the aftermath of the atrocity and the impact of the slavery holocaust. This year, the spirit of Phyllis Wheatley is 266 years young. For 266 years, her ancestral lineage was raised. Her vibration continues to ring on, ensuring that the call for justice, equality, the integrity have continued, continued to be heard, challenging and chastising the so-called civilized until the demand for equal rights and justice is realized. I've written her honoring libation in tweet, as English is not our first language. And it's important to honor her mother tongue as a child in the diaspora, my tongue is stiff. It's not used to speaking this mother tongue. So I ask in advance for your forgiveness in my mispronunciation. And tr I trust that the most high creator and ancestors will also forgive any errors. So you have some work to do here today. I ask you to step forward, please. Come in closer. Come in closer. <laughs> and I ask you too to join me in speaking sweet in a response. We'll be saying, Yadawi say. Yadawi say. Yadawi say. Yadawi say. Yadawi say. And it means we thank you. So after each pouring, we will say this. Please join me. Okay. So, I want to pour it here, but I will pour it here. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. You're going to get yeah. wet. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> get someone to pour, actually. Oh, thank you. Very appropriate. Very appropriate. Very appropriate. Very appropriate. Shiwa di ampong nyame, yetawe se, yetawe se. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Assesi ye, yetawe se, yetawe se. Mother Earth, we thank you. Numu kunsa yetum, yetawe se, yetawe se. Our ancestors. We thank you. Abusu Anum, Ako Ichiri, Ani Adeno, Me Ayenon, Yadawi Se, Yadawi Se. The ancestral families who have gone beyond and to all the names we don't know, we thank you. Yadawi Se. Menfret no Phyllis Weekly, Esia no Se. Nie Niding Yedawise Yedawise We will not call the name Phyllis Wheatley as this was not her name. We thank you. Mefreyang Baba Enua Trefo Yedawise Yedawise I call on the daughter, the author, 
we thank you. Adi sua fo, nia ria no fo, yet I will say, yet I will say, the educated one, the stolen one, we thank you. Mi frenane kunsa wanune se omu suye nisa. Yet I will say, yet I will say. I call her ancestral relations that they hold our hands. Nanen, sum sum, enko soro, yedawi se, yedawi se. So they allow our spirit, our vibration to rise. Ashe. 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 Management team of the Dorset City Hotel to uh, open up proceedings. Is that going to be you, Mark? Hey, Jim, can we give it up for Mark, the legendary hey! Mark, wonderful Mark, beautiful Mark, lovely Mark, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's going to be very short and sweet, but um, we were approached about six months ago uh, for this uh, beautiful ceremony we've got this afternoon. And on behalf of Dorset Hospitality International and our president, Willie Chu, unfortunately can't be here today, um, we would like to uh, welcome you all uh, to this site and also welcome you to this uh, celebration this afternoon. Special thanks obviously has to go to Dr. Jack, um, who I've worked very closely with, um, as well as uh, my general manager, Mike Chu, um, and he's from the Nubian Jack Community uh, Trust. We'd also like to special thanks to the Black History yeah, uh, Walks. Yeah, um, Warner. Thank you for your yeah. appreciation. Yeah. Also the, uh, the British and American Studies, yeah. um, who has assisted us with today's celebration. And last but not least, as in when you get an opportunity, we have some beautiful artwork inside from these great children here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So again, welcome on behalf of Dorset Hospitality International. And please enjoy your afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, while meeting with Mark and his uh, management, uh, uh, senior management, a lady called Mackie, Mackie Chu, a fantastic lady. And uh, so I'm in there talking to Mark and Mackie, and I'm selling everything. I've done this, I've done that. And they just said, look, Jack, Jack, stop. We're interested. We want the black. So that was an absolutely beautiful thing. So thank you so much, Mark. Again, Mark, ladies and gentlemen, give up for Mark. Fantastic. Beautiful. Okay. Um, like I said, we're going to change the order. What we're going to do now, we're going to have a representation from the American people. She doesn't want me to actually put it that way, but she was born in America. She has a very similar trajectory to Phyllis. She's also a publisher uh, and an author. Uh, has worked with, um, in uh, City Hall for a very long time. Um, very convincing um, character, wonderful lady. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know her, the wonderful Makeda Coast. <laughs> Let's give another round of applause to our brother, the incomparable Jack, Jack Hill, yeah. and the incomparable Tony Warner. Yeah. And let me single them out for a minute. I have to do that before I said, I said, do not introduce me as the representative of the U.S. government. <laughs> persistence that ensures that he has how many blue plaques so far? 46 blue plaques. Okay. Um, giving honor to the creator who is known by many names. Giving honor to our and your esteemed ancestors who have joined us today. My very brief tribute to our sister Phyllis, and it's going to be brief because we have a very full and rich program. But my tribute honors the power that can come from a quiet but determined spirit. And that came to me because I thought about, we remember the, the Angela Davises, we remember, the, uh, um, we remember people of a particular kind of energy. But I just sort of tuned in on our sister and this is what was revealed to me. You were chosen for a higher good to shine a light on truth unspoken and malign. They said we were beyond the realm of reason and intellect. To suit themselves, they reveled in the lie. You proved them wrong with dignity and grace. Your pen much stronger than the sword. Your heartfelt words still echo through the corridors of time. 
reminding us of who we are, reminding us of all we can become. And so I, did, I dedicate that to our sister, known as Phyllis Wheatley. Thank you very much. Phyllis Wheatley is a legend. She deserves to be recognized and, and, and big up as, as soon as, as much as possible. And that's what we're here to do today. So without further ado, that's it from me. Back to Jack. Uh, this is the picture. This is the one. This is the brother. Hold the mic to him. Put the mic up in the air like the Black Power salute there. <laughs> okay. The person who is going to give the keynote address for this unveiling is Ade Solanke. Where are you? Ade. Ade, come on up. Looking forward to hearing you. Thank you so much. I thought Margaret was before me on the program. That's fine. Put you on your toes. Hello everyone, I'm Ade Shalanka. It's a real honour to be here. First of all, I have to say huge respects, huge thanks, huge gratitude to the organisers and the people who've made this happen, to Jack, to Tony, who I know is one of the principal sponsors, to all the other people who've been involved. It's actually really emotional, really emotional and exciting to be here because like many of you I've known of Phyllis for some time and I've actually been working on a play, I'm a playwright, sure, as I said, I work as a writer and I've been working on a play about Phyllis for many years so when this is finally unveiled, I don't live too far from here, I've got a feeling I'm going to be just tr coming down for the fun of just seeing it as a real thing in the city of London, the city of my birth, grew up here as well, many of us did, but I haven't always felt belonging this is a small step, there's a long way to go, but just to commend everyone who's done what they've done today. I first heard about Phyllis in around 2013, and ever since then I've been researching and writing, and actually speaking about her life and work. We've, um, we've done readings of the play in Gambia. It was important for me to take the story back to the motherland. Uh, a couple of years ago we were there. We've actually done a reading in Barbados at a cultural festival, and I've done readings here with people at conferences such as Africa Rights and festivals. So a single, single thought was in my head when I embarked on this project. I literally wanted Phyllis to walk the streets of London again. It was really as simple as that. Obviously as a playwright, she will walk in terms of a character who's cast in my play on the stage. But I also wanted her to be part of what Tony's been doing for the last few years with people like Michelle and other, um, they're not actually performers, but bringing those bodies, those forgotten people, embodying them again as he does in his walks and tours. So I want my play to be part of that general move so that our, our stories and our ancestors walk, move, speak, live, breathe amongst us again. For me, they are still very much part of my living history. I walk in Phyllis's footsteps, both figuratively and literally. I actually work in Greenwich. Some of you may know the old Royal Naval College. I work at the university and my office is in a place called King William Court. Phyllis visited King William Court. She may or may not have come to see her publisher, Archibald Bald Bell, who was based at Number 8 Allgate, but she definitely, it's been documented, she visited the old, play, uh, the old Royal Naval College. Have, has anyone been to the old Royal Naval College, right? Did you know she'd been there? So she came to the office, she came to the building, which is next door to my office, so whenever I go into work, I'm literally walking in her footsteps. Um, the building I work in, the college was formerly a seaman's hospital, so my little cubicle where my desk is was once a, a, a bed for a sailor. And those sailors used to also wander around the campus when it was, it still is a tourist site, but when it was particularly a tourist site in Phyllis's era, um, they would wander around and speak to the visitors. For all I know, the sailor who was sleeping in my cabin may have spoken to Phyllis. I like to entertain myself with those ideas. Room 336 of King William Court may once have met, held someone who worked and met her. Um, so I walk in her footsteps, literally, as I walk into work each day, but I walk in her footsteps as an African woman writer. Actually, 20 odd years ago, I made a reverse journey. Phyllis set sail three times in her life. The second time was to sail to England, and she made the choice, and this is one of the issues I explore in my play, she made the choice to return. But I actually sailed to America, it actually flew a couple of years ago. And she came here because her work, although it was lauded and she was a, celebra a celebrity in America, she couldn't find a publisher there to publish her work because a work by an African was not deemed right. I mean, literally, it just could not, they couldn't fathom it, that whole Fanon notion of cognitive dissonance. Um, so I went to America on a reverse journey again to develop my work. So she's the mother in lots of ways of everything I've done. And as other writers, she was the uncrowned 
first poet laureate of America too. As writers, you always have lots of ideas, and I've actually pondered over the years what it is about her story that moves me so much. I think she speaks to me in the ways I've just spoken because she's someone who, as a woman and as an African, a writer as I am. But I think there's something else. She's rare, obviously, as an African woman in that era, because in that voice, we had, in that era, we had no voice. Um, her biographer, her biographer, um, Vincent Coretta, mentioned that out of the millions of Africans who were kidnapped, trafficked and transported, there were only 20 who were published during their lifetimes. And she was the only woman. So she stands as a unique expression, as, as someone who has a unique presence in that whole history. There are lots of reasons I'm fascinated by her story. But one thing that we have to always remind ourselves is that Phyllis was not the first African to publish a book. She was the first African to publish a book in English. There were books and there was a literary tradition, there was a writing tradition in African languages before Phyllis Wheatley and others were writing in French and in English. The other reason I'm fascinated by her story is because it, for me as a writer, opens up a whole new world. Historical fiction. Hilary Mantel, who wrote the um, Wolf Hall series, said, this, uh, this kind of fiction is about real people who happen to be dead. That sums it up for me. She's a real person. She does happen to be dead, that's all. The other things about her story, obviously you know she was a celebrity as well as a slave. Who else could say that they were enslaved and also celebrated? So as a writer, she's dramatically interesting, not just because she is the first to do X or Y. That makes her noteworthy. But as writers, we have to create drama. For me, the drama is in those contradictions, someone who was a prodigy, someone who was a poet, someone who was a celebrity, and at the same time, all of those things whilst enslaved, there's a story there. So I'm exploring her world in terms of those contradictions, but I'm also exploring the Georgian world she came into and looking at other characters like Sancho, Equiano, Arthur Torrington is here, he's done ex excellent work bringing up those stories. Um, and she met lots of interesting people who make for a great dramatic story. Oprah has a picture, and she says she always keeps it in her view. It's a picture depict, depicting a slave family, and it's placed in the center of her house, and she says it's the foundation for her life. She says this, I cannot come in the door, and I cannot leave the house without passing that painting. I'm reminded of where I come from every day in my life. I'm reminded because I never want to forget it. Now I say this because there are there, have been some, there has been feedback where people have said to me, well, why are you writing about enslaved people? That's the story of subjugation, of pain, of oppression, of, of angst. Why do we want to remember that? I'm in the Oprah camp. I never want to forget it. And I also think if we ignore it, we're also maybe tuning into the notion that somehow those people who were victims of enslavement were somehow responsible. There is no shame in having been a slave. For me, the story of her resistance, Phyllis's resistance, the story of her persistence as a writer, are stories to celebrate. Thank you. I'm coming to an end. Sorry, I've just maybe spoken a little bit much. But as I've gone into my research, what's been most fascinating, and the reason it continues to fascinate me, is because her story speaks so much to our lives and to our times. She raises, as somebody has said earlier, issues and questions about intellect and reason. Who has it? More importantly, who is supposed to have it? And who isn't supposed to have it? The notion of the great chain of being, which was very much paramount in her day, may is maybe not mentioned in our era, but it's still very much behind a lot of what we experience as people in this society. So just in brief, to finish off, <laughs> I'll quote somebody else. Um, another of my favourite writers, William Faulkner, he said, history, the past is never dead, in fact it's not even past. So Phyllis for me is a living presence, a living force, a living voice. And I think, again, we will as we walk through the city, and this will be the first of many more tributes I'm sure, have more reminders to celebrate the endurance of the people who've gone before us. Thank you. Yay! Years old. As we know, Phyllis Wheatley, we better give a round of applause to Mary Prince, actually. Yeah. Yeah.
wonderful lady in the personality of Michelle Yao, very special lady, wonderful poet, very spiritual, wonderful lady. And of course, we have Phyllis. We have Phyllis Whitney here. Yes. But she's going to be our piece de resistance because <laughs> we're going to get to talk to you, Phyllis. Uh, so that'll be really wonderful. However, before that, we have somebody who's going to do a song, but even before that, we have an extraordinary person. She is one of the people I look up to. Seriously, a very, very magical person, very magical, ladies and gentlemen. You all kind of know who I'm talking about. And she published Daughters of Africa in 1992, in which Phyllis Wheatley was featured, one of the wonderful uh, personalities featured. So ladies and gentlemen, she needs no introduction, but my goddess, the wonderful Margaret Busby. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to bring it down. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jack. And, um, I'm, I'm a trustee of the New Jack Community Trust, which gives me great pleasure, and I'm very proud of all the work that you've done, and Tony has done, and, and all the trustees, including Josephine, who's here, and Dorian, and... Jay, who else have I forgotten? <laughs> well, anyway, the, the, it continues the good work. And of course, Phyllis deserves this plaque. We know that she wasn't called Phyllis, but I mean, we have to look at what she did and where she came from. I mean, to, to have left Africa at the age of seven and to be speaking, be able to read Greek and Latin by the age of 12 to be writing poetry by the age of 14, to have published her first book. And she had to defend the fact that she'd written her, her own poetry. It, it wasn't believed, so she had to actually get an attestation in court. And her, her book, her, her, her book that uh, came out in England, actually went into 11 editions. So she was really uh, an extraordinarily well-connected and well well liked and celebrated person in her own lifetime despite what she had to go through and I'm, I'm not going to go on at great length because everybody has said most of the things that need to be said and all I want to do is to add something um, well first of all Ade, Ade who, who just spoke who just spoke before now we know has worked on on Phyllis's work life and her, her I've done a play about her. In fact, the, uh, we were almost included an extract of, of, of her play in New Doors of Africa. Thank you, Eddie. But we chose something else. And uh, uh, Phyllis was in Doors of Africa, and also in Doors of Africa was a woman called Lorna Goodison, who actually is the first woman poet laureate of Jamaica. And when I told Lorna that we were doing this plaque unveiling today, she sent me just a few words to read on her behalf about Phyllis. Phyllis Weekly to me is a perfect example of how ungovernable this thing called poetry is. She had to write. The circumstances of her life could not stop her from making poems, and she made a way where there did not seem to be any way. I am thankful that she existed thankful that she herself was in so many ways ungovernable, and I love her for that. So that's a message from Lorna Goodison in Jamaica. <laughs> Nothing more to say except I'm so pleased to be here and that we're all here to pay tribute to a really remarkable woman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Margaret. Thank you so much. Valerie Brenders, and I'm sure you all know her because I believe she is one of the UK's 100 most powerful people. Yes, you made the list last year. So we're looking forward to hearing from you. Well, hello, everybody. Can't hear you, can't hear you. Bring it right up to you. <laughs> 
take up too much time even today, but just to say thank you so much to Tony Warner. If there's anyone that's going to get me out of the bowels of Jacaranda books to come out and do an event, it's you. Um, and I just want to say that it's an absolute honour to be here. I just wrote a few lines, so I won't take up your time. Um, and it refers to, you know, as we walk around this city, which is essentially a city of ghosts, um, all this history that's sort of layered upon layered upon layered, um, it does feel like we are walking with our ancestors, uh, hidden, invisible, and um, the ones that we can see. So I said, like portals into the past, these historic blue plaques provide immediate immersion into the incredible lives of people who made their mark here and who lived alongside us and live alongside us as invisible yet potent neighbors. Their lives remind us here in contemporary Britain to honor our black heritage and the diaspora and give us the descendants solid ground to walk on as we walk around the city. We have a shape and a place in the ever shifting parameters of history because of the names of people like the incomparable Phyllis Wheatley and because of the work of people like the equally incomparable Tony Warner. Um, through him, the legacy continues. As a black woman and an independent publisher, I'm proud to be here honoring her today. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Next. Okay, next. <laughs> next is Black Girls Book Club. You might want to turn this Is it that one there? Yeah. Ow. Oh, you're here. Yeah. Sorry. You know what I love about your website? Your mission. To make sure black women are never afterthought. You go, girl. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here today to speak on behalf of Black Girls Book Club. My name is Melissa Cummings Quarry, and I'm the founder and director of Black Girls Book Club. We were founded in 2016 as a platform rooted in the promotion and celebration of black female authors. Our main goal has always been to decolonize the bookshelf and to give black literature the respect that it deserves, as well as ensuring stories from across the diaspora are shared and told. Phyllis's story is one of greatness, of perseverance, talent, and excellence. Phyllis excelled in ways that even those of us today with access could not even dreamed of. Kidnapped by tra traffickers in 1761, she went on to be published by 1773. If we were not Phyllis Wheatley, there'd be no Black Girls Book Club, there'd be no far path for us to follow. Phyllis paved the way for us to proudly and with integrity create a platform that continues to uplift us. I'd like to thank Tony and Jack and the rest of the team here today for making all of this possible, for recognising Phyllis's legacy and cementing her as a godmother of African American literature with this ceremony. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, I know you're not going to know me, but I sincerely hope you do know the institution that I'm here to represent Black Cultural Archives in Brixton. We are, I'm particularly honoured to be, have been invited here to speak today particularly from Jack and from Tony, because those two people, for me, with this ceremony in particular, have done two important things. First of all, as an American, for my accent, to honor the contributions that Black American trustee from the Nubian Jack Community chair, Trust. The Shape the chair. Oh my goodness, my apologies, Dr. Wilson. Please make your way up. My sincere apologies. <laughs> Wonderful, absolutely wonderful to see everyone here. That you've come out in support of this plant laying event for a very worthy individual. Just imagine, or we can only but imagine, what it must be like being enslaved aged seven. To taken out of your freedom into an environment of enslavement. But words are very powerful metaphors and as the Romans say that words are emitted from our mouths we speak them and listeners catch those words well she left a legacy of words for us today and for our forebears in the past for our relatives in the future and we must remind ourselves that there 
a lot of successful, uh, important, creative people in our race that are not celebrated. So I give Jack, and I'll ask you to join me, a round of applause to bring people like Phyllis Hunter to life. Words are alive. So, in essence, that's all I want to say. Remember, words are very powerful. And we all have a duty of care of leaving a legacy in some shape or form, but also to remember those that have done exactly that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wilson. I know the program says Dr. Professor. Jeanette Arnold, I see you there. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Jeanette Arnold. Yay! Legendary Jeanette Arnold. Do I understand? Are you, you retiring soon, shortly? Standing down. Maybe standing I'll down. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So that's fantastic. Great to see Josephine and Howard. Thank you so much. The wonderful JJ Mastin and of course Dorian and lovely people. Nia, Nia, Mara, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to give it for Nia, by the way. I love her beautiful brother. You, you used to remember when he used to have a fro, an afro? We're all getting old, don't worry, we're all getting old. Okay, um, what I'd like to do now is um, bring to the stage a head tutor. It's not often that you have a head tutor who's in a powerful position like Leon Evans, who's able to inspire a whole number of, uh, inspire his whole school actually. I did some work with his school previously last year, and they have done a wonderful exhibition. I hope you go inside and have a look. Also, I have to mention Joe. Where's Joe, ladies and gentlemen? Little Joe, where are you, Joe? There's Joe, can you look at this GZ here, ladies and gentlemen? Joe, come here, brother. Come, I love you, man. I do love this guy very much. Come here, Joe. Joe and I used to go to school together, ladies and gentlemen. Come here, Joe. Come here. Joe, tell the story, Joe. Tell the story. Joe, <laughs> he used to beat me up, take my pocket money. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Um, <laughs> Joe has done an installation involving the young people. So just say a little bit about that, Joe, before we introduce the... Um, okay, just some pictures of the, um, the environments and the nature and some photographs sent by the school are included in these videos here. And there's going to be an exhibition going on inside the hotel in the lobby for the next two weeks, I understand, uh, where you can see the work which has been completed. So I hope you enjoy that. Beautiful. Thanks, Joe. Okay, Leon, welcome to the safe, my brother. I'm going to lift this up a little bit. Yeah. All right. Um, firstly, I wanted to say a massive thank you to um, Dr. Jack, Tony Warner, and all of the people that came to Canada to actually help us and show us this sort of unique trail of history. Um, for Candice to be part of it allows a younger generation to be part of it as well. And that means it carries on. The work of Phyllis Wheatley will carry on year on, year out. It creates a legacy for her to carry on. And that's what history means. Phyllis Wheatley was profoundly significant for women's literature and American literature. The fact that she was black is a thing that was phenomenal. In a time where black people were being oppressed, her virtue lifted her up past slavery to freedom to a point where she could actually publish a book. And the work that Dr. Jack and the likes of Tony Warner do is so important because it allows us to see history through a wider picture. We can't see history through this whitewashed lens anymore. If, if we see it through this myopic and monotone way, then it becomes a other. People like Phyllis Wheatley become an other history and we fear what is other. And that's the danger. So today we're taking a step. It's not finished, but it's a, it allows us to see history as a kaleidoscope. And as we know, a kaleidoscope is where the patterns are more beautiful for that. And our students are actually coming up on stage to actually talk about the origin, life, and legacy of Phyllis Wheatley as well. If we run for our students. My name is Imad Al Hakim. My name is Stanley Amponso. And we were researching 
we were researching the origins of Phyllis Wheatley Excellent. and how how amazing they were. Whilst we were researching her origins, we looked deep into the region of West Africa, to the likes of Senegal and, Gam and Gambia, and we found this wealth of information and knowledge that we could use and learn more about this part of history that not a lot is known about. So we thought we could bring it to light. So therefore, we wrote a poem to represent our findings and to reflect upon this piece of history not many know about. So we titled the poem on seizure to reflect the fact that she was taken at a young age. It reads, O oh, Canberra, man and birth of Mantis crown, thine own riches conceal. Speak up, covered. speak up. Heaven, heavenly aurum. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> start again, start again, start again. It reads, start again, start again. Yeah. O Canberra, man and birth of Mansa's crown, thine own riches concealed, covered, heavenly aurum burrowed beneath your towns, the mangroves, the savannas, and the skies, Eden's bedrock laid upon Virtue's breast, Hipparius overflows Lord's favour in flesh, Griot's living, Cora playing, Timbuktu's paradise incarnate, boundless stands the horizon's cast. Harmonious gift pro bono. How can we, in mortal stance, give thanks for such beauty, such tranquility? Sun benighted, cold constraints unleashed, diseases strike, Allah Masahada, sirens searching, lurking, every shroud of hate desire. Figures foreign, decked in coats, arrest dying. On seizure, an alien abducted, strife kidnaps thine own feral bones. Sights of sorrow, sights of woe, in the hands of Goliath. Our isolation only leaps in this Christian ark. Cattle in our ignorance led to their righteousness. O oh, Cambio. And then that's the end of it. Oh. Well done. <laughs> Go girls. Okay. Hello, my name is Dario. Uh, my name is Leo now. Hello. 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 We're here to talk about the life of Phyllis. Yep. As you may know, Phyllis was a prodigy. She was special. The light in Boston, the light in London. Someone who flourished in a time of darkness. Her life, she, well, through her life, we know she suffered many hardships. She had to learn three different languages. She was from a different world. She did not understand. She had to learn. She had to reach her way up because she was someone different. And through her poems, we can see, as well as her suffering, we can see what she's achieved. And we've written a poem to highlight the fact that even though we, we, we don't know her personally, she's someone that's inspired us and she's someone who holds great depth in history. So here's our poem. Cast out of the Garden of Eden, thy tears weep for thy pagan land. At sorrowful departure's hour, that take them to the Phyllis, they said. Noah's ark descends upon the land, delivering thy people to the merchant's hand. They noticed thy glory through the writing on the wall. They took thy word, but not thy soul. Twas one across the ocean, thy saviour from Britannia. The death surrounds every corner I see through your master's veins. But life wasn't good to thee, death was more persistent. Though death thought he won, thy footsteps still wander through time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Naomi Holder. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> and we have made a poem that reflects the legacy of Phyllis Wheatley and the impact she has made on society today and many generations. Personally, when finding out, uh, finding out about Phyllis Wheatley's life, I've been greatly inspired because she was enslaved and she was a black female and she was able to do, um, achieve so many profound things, so I feel like I should be able to achieve many amazing things. Yeah. 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 So the poem we wrote was called Differences. Amongst those daisies flourished a rose. It was different, unique, and had many hidden features. The rose was different, with colour and scent like no other. The sweeper's day flew by, eyeing, sweeping the thorny flower, being pricked with reality that this rose was like no other. 
see potential in this flower, giving it a new successful, successful opportunity in life, watering it with purpose and new education. The petals drooped as it aged and the roots and lines got stronger as the creation of the Almighty was gradually being accepted by others. Our hands and heads up high for a mysterious deity, giving both females and black backgrounds a new opportunity in life. For ours and your love be strong, for making both creations of God equal, no different from one another. The rose wasn't different, it was a daisy in disguise. Wow, oh, very good. We would like to say a massive thank you to Dr. Jack and, and Tony for being able to be for being able to help us with this project and, and for giving us this amazing experience. Thank you so much. Oh. If I can just um, ask Jack to come up, it's a small stage, I'm a big person. So. Um, and Jack is one of the most humblest guys you will ever meet. And well, that's not true, is it? <laughs> Those who know me, that's he wanted to go above and beyond and he asked me to pick one student and this is the hardest thing I've done out of all of this because this all was easy for me because the students did all the work. Oh. I just sort of facilitated and I was back and forth but the students did all the work. This is the hardest bit. But because of how much she went above and beyond, so sorry boys, um, <laughs> Jack has actually got this for Karishma. I know you wasn't expecting this. There's a nice little letter in there. Uh, There's some money in there as well. And it's cash. It really so, do you want to say a little, uh, little word? Thank you so much. As in, not just from me, from like the rest of the students as well. Like, you gave basically everyone a new opportunity because something like this doesn't just reflect others it reflects everyone else like you gave both us and students higher goals in life just like Phyllis because she she came from like a really poor background and like she got kidnapped at such a young age but she still managed to achieve such good in life and now like for me and other students we'll be able to do something similar in life and like achieve high so thank you <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause, please. Yay! All the panel for all of the students who did really, really well. Yay! So thank you so much. Woo! Okay, we've just got two more acts to go, and then we're gonna we're running a little bit behind, but we're gonna do a bit of entertainment now. Oh. We're gonna have a lady called Angela, yeah, and she thought that we had uh, mentioned that it was where she lived, but no, it was the publishers. Um, Angela, that was a wonderful rendition there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, did you think that was wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. That was great. That was mm. So we're going to have okay, Mark, so sorry, have to we're going to have, um, I forgot your name by the way, Naomi, Naomi fantastic, yeah. the wonderful Naomi is going to represent the public, so she's going to be the public voice of us all, uh, looks like she's going to do a bit of magic as well, <laughs> by the looks of things, but anyway. Um, My name is Naomi Kamagaro and one of the many things that Jack doesn't know about me yet and I'm expecting it's going to be a long and fruitful collaboration over the years between us um, is that my African name is Ajwa, oh. given to me by Joseph Lagu, founder of the Anyana of Sudan and he gave me the name of his elder sister and said now I have two sister Ajwas. I feel honoured and delighted and excited to be here today as a woman born into a white skin body I'm frequently very embarrassed at the inhumanity and to be blunt the evil that people of my skin color have done around the world throughout history good things have been done as well but there has been a great deal of evil and I was brought up by parents who embraced otherness, people of all colors, people of all ethnicities, people of all faiths. And it's a great gift. And I think it's something that we need to teach all of our children. Because to me, the teaching of 
hate the teaching of a sense of otherness. It's like computer malware, and it just degrades people of all skin colors and all ethnicities and all religions. And um, I'm currently working on two books on the first ever non-white, non-European to win a Nobel Prize in any category. He was from Bengal. His name was Sir Rabindranath Tagore, but he repudiated his British knighthood after the British Minister of Jolly Mullabag. And it's one of the most period-minded geniuses to ever walk the earth. And I feel he's just one wonderful illustration among many of the great wealth of talent that people of color bring to the world. So I look forward to a new era. I feel it's dawning at the moment, a new era of truth, where the hidden genius of the past People with the great wealth of gifts can come together. And we can come together in a spirit of peace, a spirit of goodwill, excitement, because it's like we're building a new history. In the past, we've had what in current parlance we call fake history. And then now, with people like the good self, Dr. Jack, we are starting to build a true history, a history of truth, all we have balance and of justice. So I salute you, Dr. Jack, and wish you and your community, you know, a very, very long and productive life. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a beautiful speech. Why can't we all get along? Yeah, you know it is. Okay, so before we do this wonderful unveiling and finish, before you unveil the pledge of the wonderful Mark, I would like you, ma'am, to speak to the world. You are the star of the show, and I'm honoured for you to be here. So, Ledger, can you give it up for Michaela Simpson? Thank you. Thank you. I would like to say that today my heart is full, and I'm filled with a deep pride that my literary contribution to the world is being honoured with this plaque. So, thank you. Thank you. A woman of few words. Yeah. <laughs> all in the you poems. leave it after that book. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hand you over to the Master of Ceremonies, who's going to uh, take the show over the line. Ladies and gentlemen, one of our trustees, Jay Mastin. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Of the many places you could have been today, you've chosen to share it with us at the Dorset City Hotel in London. Thank you very much. <laughs> Phyllis Wheatley was a, a marvellous person. We didn't know her, but we feel her. And may our forefathers be pleased with us today. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to everyone to, we're gonna call out, we're gonna count down from five. And as we count down, everyone, I want everybody to join in, get your cameras ready, get everyone ready. But before you do that, just turn to your neighbour and say, thank you for being present for Phyllis. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being present for Phyllis. And you can put it in your walks, no doubt you will. <laughs> thank you right, for being so present for Phyllis. I'm blessing that by pulling this down. Count down from five. Five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. Newbin Jack Community Trust on this site in September 1773, Abel Booksellers published a volume of poems by Phyllis Wheatley. It's from 1753 to 1784, the first work of an African-American female writer in, published in English. United States Embassy and Dorset Hospitality International, Black History Walks. Thank you. Thank you all. Jack, we want to just say a special thank you to you. No, before you do that, no, before you do that, I just want to say, um, as one of the trustees of UB and Jack Community Trust, we don't get very often to talk because Jack, Jack likes to talk a bit. But, but um, Jack and I grew up together from the age of three. Um, he was in my house when I came home from school. He was in my room. I don't know peasant playing about with my things and saxophone and messing about, but we grew up together. And we've done many things, we've traveled many a journey, but I'm so proud to be here in support of him and his work. He's done some marvelous work. He's, he's, it's tireless. And although I do a bit myself, it pales into insignificance with what Jack does. 
endless time. He puts his own money and his time, his family time, my money. And the, time, <laughs> and the money of the trustees. And on behalf of the trustees, our chairperson, Professor Dorian, Dr. Margaret Busby, we've got Josephine there. Josephine, our treasurer. Oh, she does so much. I, a special tribute to Josephine because without her, we just couldn't do the work we do. Josephine, thank you very much. In fact, come up here. All the trustees, can you come forward, please? Yeah, we'd like all the trustees to come up because. Justin, Josephine. She's there. This is Josephine. Come up. There's, the, there's enough room. I know I'm a bit big, so come up with us. Josephine, would you like to say something? You, you don't often say much, but I know you've got a lot. Yes. <laughs> well, I just want to say I know how much work goes into an event like this. I know how much work went into the the first big thing that the charity did, which was the war memorial in um, Windrush Square. Hope everybody knows about that. Yes, yes. And the the effort to raise the money and to put it in the right places and not to go broke was quite considerable, I can tell you. We're expecting another big push now for a memorial to the Windrush nurses and you you will be able to donate to that if you choose to we hope you will yes thank you thank you Dr. again i can't emphasize how important this work is nubian jack is for us for all of us and it doesn't just mean it's about black minority ethnic um and people from the african and afro-caribbean diaspora it's about also planting those seeds of awareness amongst all races of the good work, the successful work of our people throughout the world. I just want to say uh, a welcome to Judith Jacobs, who's standing here in the crowd. Welcome, Judith. Good to see you here. And to also reiterate the welcome to all of you for taking time out to be here today at this club. Blue Club Lane event. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time. We're running out of time, so in order to keep time, I'd like to call Jack up to give the vote of thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So first of all, I just want to thank all of you for making the effort today. Thank you. Give you all yourselves a lovely round of applause. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank, I think his name is Andy. Andy the Handyman, who came and helped us at the last moment. Andy, come over here, brother. You deserve a round of applause. Come here. No stone unturned. Ladies and gentlemen, give me a hand, Andy. Give me a hand, give me a hand. Yeah, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Andy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well done. Thank you.